hundreds of multiplayer games, including those made by EA, Ubisoft, Gearbox, Nintendo, Konami, Capcom, and more, may be taken offline. GameSpy multiplayer will be shutting down. I never stopped to think about that those servers were going to go away. Wii and DS servers were shut down completely. Oh my god, Nintendo, are you even trying? GameSpy server shut down, ruins the game, can't play anymore, matchmaking doesn't work. And as far as we know, tomorrow, Halo 1 PC could be gone. It's one of those, we're shutting it down, but we're sorry kind of things. This is a huge bummer. Here at Rocket Sloth, we enjoy looking at interesting and unique stories from gaming history. So what about the instant death of hundreds of online games all in a single instance? People didn't expect Arma 2, multiple Battlefield games, Borderlands, Bulletstorm, Star Wars Battlefront 2, and Halo Combat Evolved PC, much of Nintendo's online infrastructure, and hundreds of other games to all shut down at the same time, and in many cases permanently, yet this very thing ended up happening. While nowadays, most people remember GameSpy from their days as a gaming news outlet first, the company's origins were actually kind of somewhat different. Back in 1996, id Software released Quake, which was one of like the biggest 3D multiplayer action games to ever release and to be playable over the internet. But with that, this essentially marked the dawn of an era where players would release mods for PC released games, and those could become really popular. However, with the internet still kind of in its, you know, weird 1990s infancy, finding an all-in-one place to download some of these community-created mods was kind of rather difficult. So with that, Mark Surface, who was a computer systems director for a real estate company, decided to develop a website known as Planet Quake. Now, Planet Quake would post updates on Quake-related news, but also become a major hub for players looking to download mods for Quake. The community around the site grew very quickly, becoming a de facto place for Quake fans to go and interact on the forums. But at the same time, back in those days, online games didn't have like a simple server browser. Instead, people on forums would just like post the links to IP addresses of known servers or whatever server they were hosting. It wasn't the smoothest process, but it laid the groundwork for what was next. A team of three programmers, Joe Powell, Tim Cook, and Jack Matthews, formed a small company which they would call Spy Software and created QSpy, which stood for Quake Spy, which is just a simple application that allowed for the listing and searching of Quake servers available across the internet. Very quickly, the Planet Quake admin, Surface, ended up licensing a deal with the team at QSpy to become the official distributor and marketer while retaining the original programming team that had worked on QSpy, which later would be referred to as Quake Spy. Quake Spy ended up becoming so popular that when id Software Software set out to release a big update to Quake, which would allow better multiplayer experiences and less lag when connecting online. Quake Spy was included in the official release, which was a really big deal. Kind of unprecedented for something like this to be bundled by a top tier developer. But it did serve as a huge validation for the QSpy team. But a year later, when Raven Software released a Quake Engine based game, Hexen 2, Quake Spy quickly added this game under its capabilities, now having more than just Quake under its umbrella, they renamed their company to GameSpy 3D. Then Mark Surface ended up licensing GameSpy 3D from Spy Software and created GameSpy Industries. As the GameSpy server browser tools gained popularity, they started to expand their services to support a wide range of other multiplayer games, and this was a big deal because now gamers had a convenient way to locate servers and connect with other players, enhancing the online gaming experience which essentially was not a service that had existed beforehand. They were kind of the first group of people doing this type of thing. Now, obviously expanding beyond just Quake, GameSpy transitioned also into another hub for the community to come together, which also served as a news outlet, with its big push being in 1999 when they launched GameSpy.com. GameSpy's editorial team provided gamers with in-depth content and coverage of the industry as a whole. Not only that, but the community was really active, hosting in online discussions, making user-generated content, and then it also was a platform for players to connect with each other. And in general, GameSpy just played a really big role in like the online gaming landscape in the late 90s and early 2000s. 
In the early 2000s, GameSpy had actually managed to grow its technology and started offering software development kits and middleware for video game consoles, essentially allowing other companies to license their technology that would allow players to be able to connect together utilizing their own multiplayer tool set, which was really beneficial for developers who didn't want to spend a ton of time trying to program their own online servers. They could just license out GameSpy and utilize their systems. They even purchased the technology around the Roger Wilco voice client, which essentially was used to allow players in multiplayer games on PC to communicate with each other with voice chat. This would end up peaking with 2 million players utilizing the application at one point. The technology from this program would end up getting licensed to companies like Activision, EA, Microsoft, and Ubisoft. And in a way, all of the voice chats that are used in built-in games or like Xbox Live's party chat systems all originally stemmed from this system, conceptually at least. So GameSpy wasn't just like some small community run player at this point. GameSpy had turned into a behemoth in the gaming industry with all of these close deals and working relationships with some of the biggest players in the gaming space. There were a few other websites though during this time that also made big moves in the online space and had a large number of readers and viewers visiting the website on a regular basis, like IGN for example. IGN quickly became one of the biggest gaming news outlets in the middle of the 2000s. By this point in time, the GameSpy network of websites had already expanded well beyond just the original Planet Quake, as there was now Planet Half-Life, Planet Unreal. There was a whole ton of different message boards under their umbrella. Those eventually would all be consolidated under the one GameSpy umbrella. But you can see how they started to reach out and connect these communities together by having different websites for each game that was like an individual website first. But everything soon would change. In a press statement, IGN announced that IGN and GameSpy had completed the legal proceedings for the two companies to merge together thus creating IGN GameSpy Industries, which later would drop the GameSpy moniker and just be IGN. This is actually quite surprising that not too many people talked about this back in the day because of a potential conflict of interest with IGN being a gaming review outlet and GameSpy having a working relationship with 800 different publishers where it actively had a development role in the form of creating and maintaining servers and voice communication for a lot of these games. Nonetheless, this put IGN and GameSpy kind of as one of the largest game and entertainment focused companies of its time. While the GameSpy service would continue to live on and a lot of the other aspects of the websites would eventually be consolidated into IGN, GameSpy continued to expand its relationships with other publishers and platform developers, providing middleware for Wii developers or PlayStation Portable developers. But then, once again, in another shift for the company, 2012 marked a pretty dramatic change for GameSpy. IGN opted into selling the GameSpy entity of the company over to a different company known as Glue Mobile. But it wasn't actually that straightforward of a split. Glue Mobile was just interested in GameSpy's online technologies, not necessarily the editorial side of things. So the purchase consisted just of that. To an extent, the GameSpy editorial, press, and review side of things would remain with IGN Entertainment. But this split ended up being disastrous for most of the games that GameSpy had serviced over the years. But it all started in December 2012. One night with no warning, players who were playing Sniper Elite on PC would have their gameplay just abruptly interrupted. Sure, Sniper Elite had been out for years at this point, but there still was a community playing this game. As it would turn out, over the next following nights, other games would abruptly shut down as well. Neverwinter Nights, both 1 and 2, Microsoft Flight Simulator X, SWAT 4, Hidden and Dangerous 2, Wings of War, and most notably, Star Wars Battlefront also had their multiplayer systems shut down as well. Nobody would be able to find servers, and in some cases, nobody would be able to even host their own servers, despite the fact that the game would still support peer-to-peer -peer play. Peer-to-peer -peer play typically doesn't require much online service intervention, 
only the matchmaking systems in place. So this was a weird sign as a potential full on shutdown was happening to these games unexpectedly. But the thing was, it wasn't just the players themselves surprised that this stuff was happening. Game publishers were also puzzled. There was actually no notice provided to these game publishers who were responsible for these games that the online services would be shutting down. There was a lot of questions as to what was going on and not a lot of people understood what was happening and it wasn't until Sniper Elite's developer Rebellion decided to post an open letter to the community explaining what was going on with their game and likely what was going on with a lot of other games. In the letter they stated, a few weeks ago the online multiplayer servers for Sniper Elite were suddenly switched off by Glue, the third party service we had been paying to maintain them. This decision by Glue was not taken in consultation with us and was beyond our control. We've been talking to them since to try and get the servers turned back on. We have been informed that in order to do so, it would cost us tens of thousands of pounds a year, far in excess of how much we were paying previously. We also do not have the option to take the multiplayer to a different provider, because the game relies on Glue and GameSpy's middleware. The entire multiplayer aspect of the game would have to be redeveloped by us again at the cost of many of thousands of pounds. It was great that Rebellion came in to shine some light on what was happening, but also a huge blow to all of the games affected, because most of these games had been out for multiple years and it wasn't really in the cards to expect game developers to be able to come up with enough money to revive a multiplayer aspect of the game for a game series that had a, such a small player base at that point. But at this point it was just a handful of games affected, right? But it soon would become apparent that GameSpy would be affecting way more games than just the handful shut off early on. A year later, the remaining editorial team at GameSpy saw all the secondary sites that were still from the GameSpy era under the IGN umbrella get consolidated and shut down, and Glue Mobile, the company that had acquired GameSpy and had already shut down some games already, decided to double down on their plans to cease more operations. Glue Mobile through GameSpy made an official statement in May of 2014, simply saying, effective May 31st, 2014, GameSpy will cease providing all hosting services for all games still using GameSpy. Thanks for the great ride. That is a very short and non sympathetic approach to announcing a closure that's going to affect so many games. Polygon estimated that GameSpy actually was responsible for over a thousand titles, and honestly, this time was awful. So many people were upset about the fall of many great games essentially becoming unplayable, or at least the online aspects being unusable. Another studio to speak out about the whole situation was Bohemia Interactive Studio Head, who elaborated on the situation with Arma, as it looked like Arma 2, Arma 2 Free, Arma, Cold War Assault, the original Arma, take on helicopters would all have limited multiplayer experiences with the loss of server browser, though direct IP connections might still work without the game spy servers still available. But this closure would affect CD key authentication and NAT traversal in several Arma titles. Capcom made a statement saying that there were a few titles that would be affected by the shutdown of GameSpy. Interestingly though, Street Fighter 3 Third Strike Online Edition originally ran on GameSpy, but the development team actually patched out GameSpy and replaced it with a different homegrown solution apparently, so that that game would be okay as it used the same network infrastructure of another game, Darkstalkers Resurrection. It seemed like Activision, that publisher for the most part, actually didn't use GameSpy. They had their own solution that was in-house, so all Activision games were pretty safe from getting hit with these shutdowns, even though a lot of people were worried about them, and Epic Games, interestingly, had been phasing out GameSpy for quite some time. They had expected some of the Unreal engines could have potentially been affected to this, but they were already making their own in-house solution so that those games wouldn't have any impacts. But man, there were some big blows during this time. Multiple Battlefield games, Crisis, Command & Conquer, a surprisingly high number number of racing games relied on GameSpy, Fear 2, the Men of War games, we lost online for Saints Row 2, Bellforce, Flat Out, Titan Quest, and that's just to name a few, let alone the massive hit that Nintendo ended up taking with the Nintendo Wii and Nintendo DS. Now, at this point, with it being 2014, Nintendo had already moved on to the Wii U and the 3DS hardware, but those older consoles used GameSpy as like a 
core of the entire Wi-Fi connection feature. This meant the entirety of Nintendo's Wi-Fi service for the DS and Wii would be effectively discontinued all of a sudden, and with the old age, Nintendo opted out of allocating resources to keep things going on those older systems. There were some other ones like Halo PC, which had such an active community that was completely wiped away. Online for Microsoft Flight Simulator was gone. You couldn't matchmake in Civilization Revolution. Borderlands matchmaking was gone. And then Rockstar came out with their announcement of how their games would be affected by the GameSpy shutdown themselves. Fortunately for Rockstar, they'd already switched off of using GameSpy's matchmaking and multiplayer features when building out Grand Theft Auto V. So GTA V and GTA Online weren't affected. Though, most of the previous titles prior to GTA 5 were using the Game Spy engine. However, Rockstar made a statement that they would be migrating as much as they could off of the Game Spy servers into their own proprietary servers, much like with what some other companies like Epic Games had done. So fortunately, games like Max Payne 3, Red Dead Redemption, and Grand Theft Auto 4 did not lose their online functionality in 2014. And surprisingly, you can actually still go on like an old gen console, load up GTA 4 on online and actually play. However, Rockstar wasn't completely unscathed. They would lose all of the stat tracking that was done through the Rockstar social app as that relied on GameSpy to track. The Mac version of Max Payne 3 would be shut down and the PlayStation 3 version of Midnight Club LA and Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition would see all of their multiplayer functionality ending as well. Well, this was a huge blow to the gaming community, I think that this situation really highlighted the importance of game preservation in both physical media and also online media. So many games are online only nowadays that if servers are to be shut off, parts of the game just won't exist anymore at all and can't be re-experienced. Now, unfortunately, when something at this scale happens, many of the communities that played the game regularly would not only be shattered, but would likely never play the game again online in the same capacity. However, there was a single silver lining to all of these games that lost their services. Fortunately enough, over the years, many individual communities across the games that did feature a shutdown had worked and collaborated in finding a process or a way to potentially restore online connection functionality across many of the games that were shut down. While I won't necessarily go into every single game that had a restoration project, it is very unique to see some of these specific instances. While some groups found a way to just buy pass the game reliance on GameSpy and either wrote a different system to emulate the GameSpy servers and convince the game that it is connecting to the GameSpy servers even though they don't exist anymore, or to set up some sort of service using a built-in peer-to-peer system that still was available, or some other huge system, we would see many of these games make a comeback in the sense of some sort of project that allowed players to reconnect once again. While this wasn't necessarily the perfect solution, as inevitably once those games were shut off, there will always be players that won't return and not, you know, mod their game or figure out how to access some specific fan project to play again, it at least added a means to those who really wanted to go back and experience the social capacities and the online competitiveness of a lot of these these games. You know, Battlefield 2142 actually had a pretty strong community and was one of the first games to actually see a revival effort in the form of Battlefield 2142 Revived. Except this one somehow got shut down by EA, like they DMCA'd it for whatever reason. So then that community ended up spinning off and making another restoration project called Reclamation. And that one is still surprisingly active. You can find servers still played on to this day. A few years later, Star Wars Battlefront 2 would release on Steam and have a patch that added online capabilities back into the game with a different server host. Fortunately, there was a service known as Game Ranger, which was made by one developer named Scott Kevill, who created a service that essentially lets you continue to play long-running multiplayer games as like a replacement to certain types of servers using P2P networking, and was pretty active in the community during this time in sharing awareness that some of these games could continue to operate under Game Ranger support. Battlefield 
Battlefield 2 had a BF2 hub, which you could use to replace the dedicated GameSpy master server with. Unreal Tournament 3 Black, which had GameSpy, had a GS patch, which replaced the GameSpy master servers. So it was cool to see this massive attempt from the community to try to salvage a lot of these games. Nintendo was definitely hit the hardest out of most of the game companies that were losing games that had services. The wide array of Nintendo games utilized GameSpy's matchmaking services, so many Nintendo games ended up going under. However, a fan project to continue on the Nintendo service called the Wii MMFI project was created as essentially a fan continuation of the services that were available on the Nintendo Wii, allowing for players to do things like matchmake in Mario Kart or connect in different ways using this fake service that emulated the original Nintendo services. Game Ranger was a big one, along with a lot of the different virtual tunneling network systems that are out there. Even though it's not exactly the same experience, at least it was a possibility for people who wanted to, just for a brief moment, relive some of these games. A lot of these fan projects were integral for keeping the legacy of a lot of these games alive. So, you know, Luke and I decided, hey, why don't we go and see if, hey, maybe we can play some of these games that shut down a decade earlier. Oh boy, the whole setup process was a little confusing, but fortunately Luke's a little more tech savvy than me and we were able to figure something out. Okay, so I went to work to test out some of these games and see if I could get them to play. First off, I wanted to try an EA game because lots of the games were actually hit by the games by shutdown. After doing some research and looking at the games I actually own, I landed on Battlefield 1942 as my test subject. It is a very old game and it doesn't even have like sprint, but I have some fond memories of it from playing it way back. So actually after doing some Googling and you know trying different patches and all that, I did eventually get it to work. And the patch that ended up working was something that would replace the GameSpy connection server infrastructure with, I don't know, some different server infrastructure. I don't know, I don't understand it. But here we are. I'm able to load up on Battlefield 1942. You know, I find a bunch of servers. I joined this little server. I team killed because I got confused on who's who. And then, you know, I just was able to play Battlefield 1942 for a while. And there might be times where more people are online or the game is more active. I'm not sure. I did this in the middle of the night. So it is to be expected that there wouldn't be as many people. Another game I have very fond memories of is Star Wars Battlefront 2. And this game was also hit by the games by shutdown. But as Elijah already mentioned, Disney did put some money into fixing up this game. So I to try it out for myself and i installed the steam version of the game i just found a server and just joined the server and played the game normally it actually worked flawlessly i didn't have to do anything then fear 2 project origin was another game i really wanted to try and actually it doesn't seem like you are able to play this one at all unless you simulate a LAN network i found this post from like a couple years ago where there was a group that claimed like they were very active and they had like 10 players every night which i i think is good for a fear 2 lobby and also crisis 2 was another one i couldn't get to work and it doesn't seem like you can actually get it to work when i boot up the game there's like this login window and it says you have to log into a cry tech account or whatever that is sponsored or powered by GameSpy. so that already wasn't a good sign and after some more trying there was nothing i could do to play that game which is kind of sad and then one that i messed around with longer than i should have is probably halo c custom edition which was the halo ce port made by gearbox for the windows pc you know i got the files i got all the isos i had like a key and everything but i just couldn't get it to load any servers i got as far as the server browser and it actually says powered by GameSpy right here so i guess it's cursed now there might be a way to get it to work and maybe i'm just too stupid because i found this website that lists active halo c custom edition servers and there's a couple people playing now actually i just don't know how to join them i wish i knew and that was my experience with these games but there's some other games i would like to try sometime like medal of honor 2010 because apparently that game has servers that people play on and it'd be very interesting to see how active that game is and you know kind of take a walk down memory lane because that was a fascinating game in itself after the fall of game spy i think a new precedent was set in like the game development space where many games moving forward would utilize their own proprietary server matchmaking system i don't think anybody wanted a repeat of what happened with game spy and a lot of studios took note of what companies like activision had been doing already having their own matchmaking service and also looked to 2k and how they had already kind of saw the writing on the wall and chose to migrate certain games off of the game spy servers while they still 
had the chance to do so. I think the fact that it became so costly to continue the GameSpy services or redevelop to figure out a solution for bypassing the GameSpy services that were baked into the game would have been something that in the future wasn't cost effective in case they ran into a scenario again and a lot of studios ended up switching to either a different, more reputable matchmaking service that already existed or they used their own in-house servers. There is some potency though when it comes to the whole GameSpy fall though because it really did mark the beginning of this big concern of what happens to digital games or games as a service when they become shut down or rendered unavailable to play. In the earlier days of gaming, so many online games still relied on peer-to-peer -peer networking, but by the mid-2000s into the late 2000s and early 2010s, dedicated servers and matchmaking services were now integral and people started to wonder like, how do we preserve games when services eventually run out? Every game that runs now essentially could have an expiration date at any point. This has led to a lot of working to archive and backup files, but also GameSpy shutdown kind of foreshadowed the future of gaming. Nowadays, there's a lot of games that launched as like a free to play game that didn't have a physical disc or maybe didn't even have an offline mode. And when their servers shut down, the game was just completely rendered unplayable. I used to be a player who kind of just ignored all of those cries that you read about online when people point out that a game is always online and that there's no offline mode because I was like, oh, that doesn't affect me. I have internet. I can play if it's always online. But when you really weigh in what GameSpy did and what that caused to the legacy of a lot of fan favorite games, kind of realize that, yeah, like this type of stuff where it's an online only type service does potentially put a limit as to when you can actually access the content. You know, a few years earlier, Microsoft shut down all of the Xbox original servers and Halo 2 was the most mourned game essentially at the time that lost its server access and online capabilities. But at the very least, the people who purchased the disc and had the game or they had the DLC on their Xbox could still access those maps, play it LAN, play it locally, and then use virtual tunneling software to connect to other people around the world if they really wanted to take it the next step. Nowadays, if a game was just based on its online service, like Gotham City Imposters was, for example, that game is just gone. And more games down the road would also disappear when their services would shut down as well. As a kid, one of my favorite games was definitely GoldenEye. But when I later got a PlayStation 2, Nightfire was like the coolest game ever. Now, I could only play that game like single player or maybe like split screen if I had a friend or like my brother playing with me. But outside of that, Nightfire was really cool. I didn't know until years later that there actually was a PC release of this game, uh, one that's not very good, but was full on multiplayer with connectivity that was hosted by GameSpy. So Nightfire was another one of those games that ended up getting hit really hard by the GameSpy shutdown. Can you can you still play it now? Or? Fortunately, when GameSpy shut down, the community came together, made a mod that allowed people to connect to servers. It uses a whole other system known as OpenSpy, and OpenSpy is kind of like this whole other rabbit hole. It was a whole part of this GameSpy arc that not a lot of people really even know about but it was really ambitious for what they were trying to do. So OpenSpy was a community project to essentially emulate all of the GameSpy servers, which would allow people to connect in their internet settings through a DNS server directly to a system that emulated what GameSpy used to do, essentially an attempt to bring most of the games that were shut down online again. Now, it didn't actually bring all of the games online, but I did look into this a little bit, and there are people out there who've been able to get Nightfire playing again in the multiplayer, as quirky as that game was. It was this like whole Bond game where it's not based on a movie, but it still had Pierce Bronson in it. So it was, it was cool. So like OpenSpy, you just like put in a different DNS server and some like different IP maybe, and then you can connect. Is that, am I sending that right? I think it's that simple. There might be some extra steps. I was trying to read through the instructions and it was like incredibly vague. I think you have to go to their discord and then there's like more information on it. But it was interesting. I could look at the server numbers though, which I found really interesting. And there were actually still people playing Nightfire. It's probably one of the most populated games that's not like a massive competitive game. There were some people, but there's also like a couple servers that have like bot players in there. Like in case you there weren't people online you wanna play against bots. I think it's a little inflated. Yeah, actually, but I feel like that, you know, some games do that or some old servers had that a lot. Like I remember going on Counter-Strike servers and there would just be a full lobby of bots until like someone else joins, you know? Yeah, I noticed that in, I think Call of Duty World at War, there were a couple of servers like that, that just had the, like you think it's like a super popular server and you click on it and it's like, there's no one real. It's honestly, it's kind of clickbait actually, you know? 
Dude, clickbait before like the YouTube days. I mean, this was before. This was after YouTube. We got clickbaited on the server browser back in the day. I just want to say this here. Now I've heard the Nightfire PC port was really bad, and it's kind of a shame because Nightfire is a gem of a game. If you've ever played like first-person shooters and you liked the like GoldenEye or Nintendo 64 era Perfect Dark any Bond game. Nightfire was super underrated. I really enjoyed the story of that as a kid. It is interesting looking back at footage of like people online who've posted their like gameplay sessions, like playing it in 2021 or something. And like, it looks really jittery. Like the other players look like they're moving in like some alternate universe and you're just seeing a reflection of them. And like, if they if they jump, it like, I don't know, the animations just look really bizarre. We'll find footage and we'll show it when we're talking about it, but it's, it's, it's really just a goofy experience. But I think it's interesting that Nightfire ended up being so popular out of all of those games. But the interesting thing though about Open Spy is when I looked, on average, there's about 300 to 400 players listed. Now obviously some of them can be bots, but I think there is a decent chunk of real people playing. Now the most popular game on there, if you look at their servers on their website, is the Unreal Tournament games. There's a couple different versions of the game listed on there that have server support. I didn't know that GameSpy had more than just, uh, I think, Unreal Tournament Black, but this supports that. And they did say that OpenSpy would support some games that didn't even use GameSpy, potentially, if it was compatible, like Age of Empires, one of those games, I think, is an example of that. But it's just interesting this whole thing exists. Not a lot of people actually know about it. And it even had other things like Battlefield, the two Battlefield games that you played earlier through the revival projects right yeah, yeah, yeah so open spy supports those games but nobody is playing them though actually that's interesting because i feel like if it's also an open spy then all these communities are split because there's like a different patch that i used for 1942 that is not open spy they just removed the game spy i found servers there and then like for battlefield 2142 there's like another revival project that's also separate from open spy so i wonder if those communities are like split which is like insane you know what i mean it's like a dead game that wasn't playable for years and now like there's like these split communities because there's different ways to play this game i found it interesting that the open spy side had no players on battlefield i feel like they're all on like those special projects right i did see some players on uh, battlefield 2 on game ranger actually interesting is that different from what you played on yes that's also different so maybe it is more split than we thought and then i think you can also connect on some of the supported games that use game spy with an actual playstation 2 which is very cool to me i mean i know that some people still play online games with the playstation 2 fantasy star online is probably the first one that comes to mind but yeah so like people play those types of games they still connect online through like a placeholder server held like a placeholder server that the community has made or like a fan project that has revive the servers to keep them going but open spy does potentially work with some of those games and you just have to change your internet settings through that and um apparently i looked through it to see if anyone was playing on the playstation 2 when i checked there was one person playing modern combat all by himself online on the ps2 as according to their servers but that was it there was there was no one else on any PS2 game that I could at least see. The last warrior on modern combat. <laughs> Dude, he is the last man standing on modern combat. I'm proud of him. This whole open spy thing actually kind of reminds me of those, like, you know, the Project Sunset stuff and, like, that original Xbox rival thing. Like, where you also change your DNS and stuff and then you're able to connect into Halo again, like, on the 360 servers. Right, Project Sunset. We talked about that in our video on, what was it, like, games that came back, maybe? Yeah, yeah, I guess I came back. Yeah, and, and similarly, like Halo 3 and other games on the Xbox 360 that shut down had fan projects revive like an emulated version of the service that people could connect to and still play on actual hardware, which is really cool. Then we also have like the Wii MF... MMF... MFII. The Wii MFII, I think is what it's called. It does the same thing. Nintendo's servers all shut down on the original Wii, and this was a service to bring back online play for people who were natively playing on the Wii. I think it's a little more complex in some situations. You might need to have a homebrewed Wii, but I actually want to say that you can do some things with just the default Wii, the like stock model, uh, by just changing the DNS settings once again. Surprisingly, the internet connectivity and support that is on the Wii is impressive. I was talking to one of our friends and he actually uses the Wii for the weather app, like still, like, 
all this time later, the weather app is still getting used? Yo, I actually saw someone order Domino's off the Wii too recently. Wait, recently? I mean, like, I don't know, the video seemed like it was recorded within the last two or three years, so. That's actually insane. But it is interesting how this has kind of kept some games alive. Mario Kart obviously was one of the most popular games that had online play back in the day. I feel like if Wii Sports had online play day one, that would have still been, it would have been popping off for sure. Dude, imagine like getting into boxing lobbies with some randos and just like Dude, imagine if the Wii launched with boxing lobbies and voice chat. Yo. Though, like, you know how to, you know, voice chat would have been some, you know, something else. Yeah, the Wii, the little Wii speak thing that you had to put on your counter for Animal Crossing, and it sounded like the worst, the worst noise. But I would have made it where, like, you needed a second Wii to, like, open up the the chat app and something like that, you know what I mean? Yeah, so Mario Kart's surprisingly still active. I also found a small community of people who usually communicate through Discord who play Super Smash Bros. Brawl, like the base version, not like the modified version that people play and then they like do like the land tunneling or whatever, or however they connect virtual land. Oh, like on Dolphin? Yeah, uh, on Dolphin. But there are people who just play the stock version of Super Smash Bros. Brawl, which I find hilarious. That was the first Nintendo game on the Wii that had online play. And I remember being so hyped for online play. I was finally getting to experience what online play was about when I got Super Smash Bros. Brawl. And you had to sit there and like connect to the Wi-Fi and it half the time just didn't work. It was like this terrible experience. And then if you did get a game, there was a high chance there would be like ridiculous lag, like to the point where the game's moving at like half speed of what it's supposed to. I watched some gameplay of people who were using the uh, Wii MFII thing to play Super Smash Bros. Brawl and <laughs> the gameplay's the gameplay was okay, like maybe the internet connection was more stable, but the uh, like connectivity was still interesting. They were just like, half the time it just wouldn't connect and show them who their friends were. It would say you failed to connect to the servers, and I think that it's just a genuine problem with how Super Smash Bros. Brawl was developed. Like, they didn't have the internet stuff figured out right away, and uh, I thought that was really interesting though. That it wasn't just like, hey, we're on primitive you know, hardware with people who don't maybe have good internet connections. It was just genuinely like, I think that game was programmed with really bad net code or something like that. Actually, you know, I have a similar story with Mario Kart 7. So I think like this whole net code issue is like a Nintendo issue, really. Nintendo and bad internet? What? I mean, they don't do multiplayer very well, even nowadays. I mean, they do it better, but... It functions. Sometimes. They could improve it a lot. But uh, yeah, I remember sitting in a Mario Kart 7 lobby and just waiting for like 10 minutes and like then finding a game maybe. And then like it was laggy and I just never played an online game on the Wii again. Now most of the Call of Duty games obviously weren't using GameSpy. I think there might have been a couple on like the PlayStation 2 that were like the spinoff ones. Like maybe the big red one or something might have used GameSpy. But what's interesting is when Nintendo saw most of its services shut down people just assumed a lot of these other games died off, but there are still people out there playing Call of Duty Black Ops on the Wii. And I think that that is incredibly impressive. Now I had to do a little bit of research because I was trying to figure out if it was, maybe the Wii version was set up with GameSpy or something because Nintendo had so many games that use GameSpy. I'm not hundred percent sure if that's the case, but nowadays you can still play Call of Duty Black Ops on the Wii using Activision's matchmaking servers, which are still up, but if you just go in with the stock version of the game, it won't work. You actually have to modify your game using a mod, I think it's called like Gecko or something. And essentially the problem with Call of Duty Black Ops Wii is the login authentication servers are down and I don't know if those will ever get fixed. So this mod lets you bypass the authentication and then if you bypass that, you're able to use Activision's matchmaking system just fine because all activision servers do are just find other players connected and pair people up then it goes into a peer-to-peer -peer network and it hosts it off of you know someone else which obviously isn't as good as a dedicated server but it is interesting to see that sometimes people still upload videos of them playing black ops on the wii all these years later and i just think that that's really fun that's crazy because like a lot of developers um would just shut off matchmaking you know what i mean like for a game like that, especially. It's crazy that Activision just leaves it on. Do you think Activision even knows that it's still on? I, okay, like, it, could be, it could be a thing where like, they just forgot. <laughs> it's like on some back server. And or maybe it's like a thing like, I don't know, like 
if they turn it off, maybe some other thing breaks and like they're like, uh, let's just not deal with it. You know what I mean? The person who knows where the Black Ops Wii server is no longer works at the company. And it's just like it's just like a string of text. Like they don't even know what server it is. It just has been on for, you know, like 15 years or whatever. And they're just like, hmm. or or hey, how do you like this theory? When Modern Warfare 2 came out, right? Modern Warfare 3 came out, whatever the last one is. They tried shutting it off, but none of the games would work. What if it's like a chain reaction? It's like a domino effect. Like everything is rooted in the Wii matchmaking system working. Yeah, so it needs to stay on. It's like the life source of Call of Duty games. I like that theory. Maybe they're trying to shut it off and they turn off the authentication servers and people find a way around it. And they can't shut it off unless people organically leave it alone. <laughs> they're like, please stop. Please stop playing Black Ops on the Wii. Please let us retire it. Yeah, so I thought that was really interesting that there's this bypass by modding the game that can let you actually play the game. Have you guys looked at Black Ops Wii gameplay footage lately? It is, it is insane. I, I forgot what that game looked like and it looked like something. It wasn't good at the time. I want to mention that, you know what I mean? It's not like people were like, oh, this amazing graphics, this game in, in, uh, on the Wii. Now, shifting a little bit away from games, the main game Spy Shutdown, there is other projects that are interesting. Obviously, in this video, we compared the Game Spy Shutdown to Xbox that shut down a couple of years before Game Spy, the original Xbox servers. And we've talked about this in another video, so we won't, like, harp on it. But there is a project called Insignia, which is interesting. It's a lot like the Wii MFII thing, where they try to let you connect through DNS servers to an emulated system that recreates the original online servers. Except Xbox Live is a little bit more complicated than that. So there are a couple extra steps than just like entering a code. You have to, I think, run like a modded thing on the Xbox. But modding the original Xbox is like the easiest thing in the world comparatively to other systems. But what was interesting is I was looking at Insignia recently because they've announced that they're working on other games that aren't supported yet, like Halo 2. But the process of signing up for Insignia and getting that running now, because that's fully out, is such a cool experience. You go in there, you have to like enter like your information, like your email address and like verify it with their Insignia servers. But you use like the Xbox interface with like the green and all that. And then you have to like choose a gamer tag again. If it's taken from like the Insignia servers already, it gives you like the recommendations, the same system that Xbox used to use for Xbox Live back in the day. Then it takes you to a billing screen because it's like a part of the process for going online. And they don't want to take your credit card information. It's a free service, but they literally tell you a fake credit card number that you're supposed to enter in the box, like a specific number that will like automatically approved and it'll give you like a lifetime membership for insignia but it's like all built into like the same systems and steps you would go in when you're logging into xbox live so i just i was looking at that when i was doing i fell down the rabbit hole researching this and i thought that that was like an incredibly cool like experience in itself beyond just getting to play old games that aren't available anymore the fact that like this login process to get these old xbox live features is still intact in that way by using a system similar to what we saw with like open spy and the we mfii thing it is interesting though that like it's during this weird time where like online games were just starting to become more commonplace on console like i mean the gamecube did have one game or like a very small handful of games that had any type of online connectivity. Did you have to buy an adapter to even like play? I think so. I don't think it had an ethernet built in. So like, I, Fantasy Star might've been the only one. There might be like a, a couple of like obscure games also, but then it was like the Wii had a couple of years with nothing. And then they did the Smash Bros, Pokemon Battle Revolution. I played that a bit. And then Mario Kart probably popularized it. Like, then the Xbox came out. That was, like, the big thing with Xbox Live, which was, like, kind of ahead of its time. PlayStation 2 had their online thing, and that still has a couple of games going. I know, like... I just think it's interesting that, like, these services that were, like, so primitive back in the day, catching up to, like, what PC could already do, still have, like, to some extent, like, a community of people that want to keep that thing alive. And I think that's big for game preservation. Yeah, no, it's, it's good to keep these games around. And, I mean, like, I don't know. If people enjoy it, why shouldn't they be playing it? I mean, you know, look at Javelin. Prost's been stuck on Halo 2 for the last uh, 20 years, and I mean, why not? We'll make fun of him for it, but, you know. Yeah, he'll never get off that game. Never get off the game. But, you know, actually, maybe that's that's how we just got to imagine these people playing, like, Nightfire or Battlefield 2 all these years later. It's like the Javelin type, you know? They just they just love their game, and that's all they want to play. Right. It's kind of like when um, 
you know how like the Call of Duty servers were broken last summer for a really long time? Right. And then they fixed it and it kind of caused like an influx of new players going back and reliving those games. Like that was really cool. Just being able to go back and like be nostalgic on some of those games, knowing there was a population there for a little while. Like World at War was obviously like my favorite Call of Duty game. And you know, the game we've had times where we go back to play that game and there's nobody online except like our group of friends who want to play. And we have to like go into like team tactical, which is like you need four players to start two on each team and we have to all queue up to see if we can like get a server going and then random people join in seeing that there's like four people online. So I know there's other people out there trying to find where everyone's playing and when there's not a server browser, you have to just go based off the playlists. And um, it was just cool to like go back and experience it when there's a lot of players. So uh, it is nice now though with these online services that there are Discord servers out there of people who are like, hey, does anybody, you know, for a specific game, you can always find like when play sessions are. Right, just find the lobby. Yeah, like Discord replaced the matchmaking basically. Yeah. Dude, we should do something on our Discord to revive some random game. Like Call of Duty World at War or something. <sighs> You just want to play Call of Duty World of War. I think you can find lobbies on it. Like, I don't know, dude. I don't know. So that one time we hopped on, remember, I added all those people. Because I was like, these are the last World of War players. But was that before the fix or after the fix? That was before the fix. But it was before it broke. Right, right. But like, now the fix happened. So maybe you have more luck. Have you tried it recently? You know? All right. I'll... I'll we'll play World of War after this and find out. I do hope at some point developers realize that, like... It, it would be kind of cool to turn some servers back on like for a weekend or something maybe like a little event or something you know what i mean right didn't that one game do it we talked about it last time i forgot the name of the name of the game yeah i forgot the name because i never played but yeah yeah like that and i don't know it would just be cool if some of these old games just maybe like a weekend every like five years or something i think that would be enough and like i think that would be a good fan servers i'm trying to remember the name of the game i feel like we have to say it or else people are gonna be like annoyed no, we don't have to say it. It was some obscure game. Dude, if someone that played that game... No, I played it. What? I played it. We have to figure out what the name of the game is. Gigantamax or something. I don't think it was Gigantamax. I think that's Pokemon. Something like something like the sounding like that. Was it, was it just called Gigantic? Maybe. Yeah, it was just called Gigantic. Where was the Gigantamax come from? How do, I said something like... That sounded like it, doesn't it? Okay. It, they, they brought the servers back for Gigantic for like a weekend for the players who really wanted to play it after five years of it being away. Nobody knows if that's like a sign of the game coming back. We talked about it before, but I just wanted to make sure. Gigantamax, what? <laughs> I don't know, it just sounded like something. I mean, it was close. I mean, it means that you knew the name of the game the whole time we were trying to figure it out. I didn't know the name of the game. You said Gigantic, almost. No, I said Gigantamax and something that sounds like Gigantamax. And it did, dude. Just don't hate on the method, dude. It worked. But why wouldn't you just start with the easier word, like Gigantic, instead of going all the way to the Pokemon Gigantamax? You become a brain surgeon to analyze my brain. Well... This was uh, enlightening, I think. This was uh, yeah. a little bit of a different type of video. I hope you guys did enjoy it. A huge shout out to our patrons who've supported our channel, allow us to make content like this, try different things. I know we've been doing a lot of different types of videos, but if you watch this far into this specific video, it's kind of like a his history of like a gaming topic. It's different. We really appreciate you giving it a try. Uh, some feedback would be awesome if you guys want to see more stuff like this. And uh, yeah, I, f I feel good about this one. I liked I liked the topic. Yeah, it's an interesting video, for sure. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, we'll see you guys all next time with a new video. Make sure you're subscribed with notifications on. If you're on TV, the extra two steps you do to hit the subscribe button helps us a lot, actually. Uh, so you'd be really cool for that. Okay, uh, we'll see you guys all next time with another video. Bye. Bye bye.